let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back to Thick Radio, the podcast where we talk about gaming, feedism, and everything in their orbit. I'm James. And I'm Tim. So let's get into it. Today we're welcoming to the show for the first time, we've got a friend of ours, Bate. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm doing good, trying to keep warm. I'm glad you're well. Thank you so much for joining (laughs) us. We've really been looking forward to do this episode. I mean, I, I, I always think the dating episodes... Tim, I don't know how you feel about this. I feel like when I look at the stats, like our dating, sex, intimacy, and all that, adjacent episodes tend to be some of the most heavily listened to. So I imagine that people may find today's dialogue most illuminating and most intriguing. So on that point, Bate, are you ready to get hooked into it today? Oh, yeah. Fabulous. So just to clarify on a couple of points here at the top of the episode, What labels, if any, do you align with, identify with in the gaining fetus community spectrum? Well, I definitely, let's see, so I'm definitely an encourager. I like that. Um, I mean, feeder encourager, I do like the word encourager a lot because that's what it feels like when I'm doing it. Um, And then also, I'm new, I'm fresh. I've only been doing it um, since I met my partner. Uh, so last year, well, sorry, 2022, my bad. Uh, so you, so you've been in a, in a dynamic since 22 and, and this is the first gaining fetus relationship or dynamic you've been in. Um, intentionally. Yeah. Like I've been with, with people of all genders, uh, who have been tiny, who have been really large. Some are like morbidly obese and some who have been like, you know, really, really thin. Prior to this relationship, have you, like, just in your regular hookups or dating life, you know, did you have a preference for fatter people or? Um, I definitely like folks who have meat on their bones, like that phrase, like more pushing for the cushion, because I used to be primarily a top. And when you're pounding it out, like I had one partner where I actually got like bruises on my pelvis because his butt was pointy because <laughs> he was so skinny so yeah been there <laughs> yeah. no i've had that experience before probably the one and only time i've been with someone who i suppose you would classify as like that you know fit adonis style guy he was a personal trainer and i couldn't even get past the dry humping it bruised my hip bones to have him clacking against me it's like when you knock your knees together or click your heels by accident you feel that reverberation <laughs> of pain in your skeletal system it was sort of a bit, bit of that really yeah wasn't any good you know like a like a delicate chandelier or you know it's like, like a cheap set of like wooden wooden chimes just sort of yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like, a oh, like, a... A, like a bull in a china shop <laughs> just a lot of broken ceramic i call it um surface hole <laughs> it's where oh, like oh. where the butthole is just right there you don't have to spread anything it's just it's right right there <laughs> there's no cheek there's no cleft it's oh. just a smooth surface yep if they bend over it's just right there <laughs> you need to bend over it's just like just present anyway. yep mm. which is hot in its own way not trying to you know not trying yeah, to knock no. it like yeah. i dated that guy for two years so i mean <laughs> it did what it did um but so, like, how did you find yourself in a relationship specifically with a gainer? Like, was that intentional for you to start to look for a particular type of person? Or was it more just like a, hey, BT dubs, this is me type of thing? Uh, well, my partner, who's okayed me using his name, his name is Sam uh, online. He's Roaming Hog or the underscore Roaming Hog. Um, he actually reached out to me on my twitter and he came into my dms really really hot (laughs) and was immediately asking to um actually collaborate make film and so yeah he i did not seek it out i had just been through a pretty tough relationship and i have my 
personal rules it's like i don't i don't even go on dates for nine months after i get out of a relationship it's just my personal thing i've done it since i was younger um and uh yeah he just showed up and we hung out and we had like he we were joking about him being like a disciple of gainerism because i remember i fed him a donut and we were just like in a car and it was probably one of the most intimate like sexual sensual experiences i've ever had um and it's never felt like that before and obviously it had to do with like him being hot and the chemistry but also just you know feeding can be very very sensual Mm. I mean, I know we've touched on this a little bit in episodes around feeding, but you know, I think a lot of kink people can agree whenever there's things to do with kissing, choking, asphyxiation, strangulation, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Anything that involves like the neck, the mouth, the airway, there's something very like, I don't know, the subconscious lizard brain says, oh, my life is in your hands. I surrender to your will. If you wanted to kill me, you could, but you're not going to. We're going to have a really good time. And I, I don't know. I imagine that's like a part of it, right? Um, but it's really cool that you discovered this thing where it's like maybe you hadn't thought about it before, but like you had the chance to do it and you did it with a particular person and you went, oh, hold up now. This is yeah. a... This is a winning thing. So since 2022, you've been in that dynamic, which is really, really cool. And I love that, you know, there's new people coming into that space. I mean, Tim, I know we've kind of joked about this a bit, that like uh, people like bait are very uncommon in the community. People who are like happy to show their face and be seen with a fat person and also be like, yeah, I'm actively contributing to the fattening of my partner shamelessly. Um, does that kind of do anything for you to know that there are people like, regardless of age, kind of newly coming into the space? Yeah, and I want to know where they are because I've not found any locally. Um, it's kind of like discovering a unicorn. It's like you, you're okay. into somebody and you're, you're like, oh God, I have this fetish. I don't know if they're going to be okay with it because it's, you know, it's subversive and they're going to see like my body's going to change over the course of the relationship and they might not want to be seen in public with someone like that. And, you know, you have all these fears and then you find out that the person that you're interested in is like, oh no, I'm totally on board. I don't care. I don't give a fuck what people think. Like, this is all about us. That's an exceptionally rare thing to find because most people, average citizens, they are hung up on you know, the the public um, perception of themselves, the public perception of, of them as a couple. Like, I hate to say this, but gay men are often not only judged individually, but then they're judged by who they date as well. Like the couple becomes sort of a unit and like the community begins to think of them as a unit in a certain way. So <clears throat> yeah, I would love to be able to find someone who maybe didn't know much about it but then really gets into it once they discover what it's about like that'd be great gotta find somebody who's uh maybe grew up really christian and sheltered <laughs> and dealt with all that shit so then the, when they get into their, their well, later sure adult it, life you know <laughs> i'm sure it helped too that you were you were already kinky before that right before you met him you were you, you were already doing your own thing on twitter right um yeah actually but it was pretty that joke was like specific so like i feel personally that the reason why i am so open-minded is because i wasn't allowed to do anything for such a long time i grew up baptist um in michigan which is like uh not what people think about when they think baptist like you know hoop and holler and good food clapping none of that none of that um wasn't allowed to do anything at all and so when i got to my i remember being like wow when i move out i can watch porn like, I remember thinking and being excited. Like, that was my, like, one of my adulthood goals was to be like, I'm going to get a computer and I'm going to watch fucking porn. Um, but I wasn't super, I've always been really open-minded. So I guess that is synonymous with kinky a lot of times. But I had actually just started kind of realizing my own fetishes and my own, like, wants and stuff just a few months before Sam came along. I mean, I think that's also reflective of a lot of people who come from some kind of conservative themed background. I think a lot of people are very quick to judge 
people who are more vanilla or more slow to start when it comes to certain things because i think you're you're in your mid early to mid 30s is that right i'm gonna be 34 on friday uh, happy birthday but you know i think maybe this is something you could have experienced where people will sort of look at you and go oh like you haven't done this yet you're a certain age what do you mean you haven't done this and you're just sort of sat there like correct assessment i just haven't for different reasons please don't be a dick about that um so sometimes we are kind of met with expectations that are a bit silly um but i think what's really wonderful about this is clearly there has been healing there's been a sense of overcoming maybe some of those hang-ups and for you a sense of really stepping into this fruition of your own which i think is reflective of this relationship you're now in you know it's when you first kind of come out into this space you're sort of more willing to say i will kind of try anything do anything i'm willing to wear my heart on my sleeve and be open out and proud about it because i just want to own and live in the fullness ironically of whatever this expression is and i think we can see that very clearly from your relationship i mean what aside from the gaming aspect um what do you feel like are some of the biggest differences with your relationship with sam roaming hog versus relationships you've had in the past um aside from i mean sexually obviously is the is a big one but i'll start with like emotionally first like sam is actually almost eight years younger than i am and we didn't know that beforehand um personally i would have never sought it out you know but then you get to know somebody and I mean he also thought I was younger but he didn't care when he found out <laughs> um emotionally he is really mature and I mean not to get like too deep but like he's never laid his hands on me which is pretty rare with guys that I've dated he's never laid hands on me um he is never never um he doesn't he's not a yeller which is I'm not either and it shuts me down um, I actually got to talk to his dad over Christmas and like we had a moment alone and I was like, I've been with a lot of guys. Uh, however, like Sam isn't just one of the best partners I've had. He's one of the best men I've ever met. And that, I mean, it, I could see it made his dad proud to hear it, but so emotionally he's just really mature. Um, and that means that the sex and the relationship there is better sam and i both identify more as sides um like obviously i love shoving stuff up my ass um and but like with sam it's just really open um he was willing to have conversations about like how we were both going to enter in a relationship both as like technically sex workers like you know a lot of our income comes from our fan pages so when you get in a relationship what are you going to do just both get full-time jobs like so that was that was really great and the way that differs from previous relationships is just nobody was willing willing to have hardly anybody was willing to have that conversation or to communicate as openly as we do and sam this is the end part of the answer <laughs> uh sam wasn't really used to communicating that way but he has fully like gotten into it because once you start communicating that way and being open and honest about stuff the benefits are like undeniable honestly i love hearing all of this because I, like like we touched on before this episode is really centering in on dating and obviously your current relationship i feel like sometimes people forget that yes gaining in a relationship is something that we're all interested in but the root and the foundation of any relationship still needs to be maturity respect responsibility communication and I love hearing that you both have that, are willing to bring that to the conversation. So that's wonderful, you know, and makes me very happy to to hear that, especially as an improvement on on past relationships. I mean, Tim, you and I are both dating civilians. Yeah. Um, I mean, asking an obvious question here, but do you feel like those aspects of like consent, communication, respect are like tantamount and core to your relationship with Matt? Absolutely, because um, my late husband was exact opposite, you know, lied to me constantly, played head games with me, gaslit me, manipulated me, um, and you, you you turn into a fucking wreck. Like, I spent 12 years being an emotional wreck, 
Um, so thank God that I found somebody as mature as Matt, because if I had to do that all over again, I'd be like, I just say, fuck it. I'm staying single. Yep. Like I'm not doing this. Mm. Which it just as an aside here, um, is probably a good thing for people who are looking to find their way into a relationship, a good thing for people to consider. Like, and obviously this is easy. Each of us three are in relationships. It's easy to preach and think, no, wait for the right time. Like, I understand sometimes you're not in the mood to hear that, but like very genuinely, when you've been in a relationship or just dating for long enough, like, I feel like you do reach a point where you just kind of get fed up with other people. Like, if I'm going to have you in my life, like, I don't just need to know that you're like a good person. I need to know that like, I can have you in my space and not want to actually throttle you for having like some kind of weird ick. I need to know that you're going to pay rent on time. <laughs> I need to know mm -hmm. that you're going to show up when I need you to show up. It is more than just this in initial spark that a lot of people go on about. Like there's got to be an element of sustainability. Like, are you someone who is going to start to walk with me as ironically a partnership through life together um i think age plays a, a, a part in it like you're saying like the older you get the more you're kind of like i don't necessarily need somebody around all the time and i think that a lot of people confuse like a fear of being lonely with a fear of being alone you know like i can be alone but i don't like to be lonely and there are certain hours of the day that i don't like to be alone in the house like i've never enjoyed being alone at night it's just something that gives me anxiety but um I think that once you can realize that, you know, that there's a difference between those two things and you figure out, okay, am I just, do I just not like to live alone or do I not like the feeling of being lonely? Because either one can be easily solved without getting into some like complicated, messy situation where the two of you are clearly not right for each other, but you're just too afraid of being alone that you're staying together, you know, because I've done that and it's the pits. It is hell on earth. I would never wish that on anyone. Yeah that's we were talking about like differences and that with sam in our relationship now like one of the things that we laid as boundaries in the beginning was like i am in my 30s and i don't need to be around someone 24 7 also if we were around each other, each other 24 7 we would be upset at each other <laughs> more often and so it's uh yeah it's it's good that's you said the difference between being alone and being lonely and like definitely, you know, gauging that as I get older and part of the age thing was too, like when we met and we're going through like this courtship thing, like I was like, look, like, I know I want to be with you and you know, you want to be with me. So like, we got to figure out what's going on because I'm not trying to wait around here for two more years, you know, while people make up their minds. So let's have these conversations and get them out of the way. <laughs> Mm, that is another aspect of uh, dating that I think sometimes people get a little bit schmear at, you know, people want to have the fun and want to just kind of focus on, oh, no, we're in this like light, fluffy part. And like you can do that. But I also think if what you really want, again, is that sustainable relationship, you really do have to be prepared to ask some of these more in-depth questions and be more vulnerable. With some, be more willing as well to kind of show your hand because you're not trying to play games at that point. You're just trying to lay them on the table and be like, look, this is these are my hangups. This is where I'm at. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. These are my deal breakers. These are my negotiables. What have you got? And you li it literally is like a merger. It's a it's do you, you know what I mean? So I'm listen, I love that that conversation is happening. That's just putting it out there to people. If this is really something that you're struggling with, bear these types of points in mind. If you're finding people that are unwilling to have these conversations, that probably isn't going to bode well for the future. Just saying. But on that point, talking about like how you how you do what you do, like what do you feel like is the biggest misconception people will probably have about your relationship with Sam? Um, I would say, I think that like people think that we're probably just here doing gainerism things kind of oh not that we don't do it a lot there's aspects of it that happen every single day um but i think that i kind of already touched on it too just like it's not our entire sexuality um it would be wonderful you know if we could be independently wealthy and i could just you know feed sam 
all the time and encourage him and he could just sit around getting like really, really fat. But um, one thing I think some people have caught on to, but this is the more realistic aspect is I think money, like having to actually, we want to build a life together and that takes, um, you know, money. And then also we are, we want to build a life together so we can spend our lives together. And if he is, um, you know, he or I get so unhealthy to the point where we're not able to be around anymore, that cuts that short. And I know I've, I've learned from Sam and like my own research, like there is obviously like the more morbid, um, you know, part of the fetish that comes along where people want to be, you know, so fat that they get hospitalized and perish. And um, Sam doesn't have that fantasy and neither do I. Um, so that's one aspect. The other thing I think that is more realistic is I think some people get into gainerism and think that it's all just eating really unhealthy food. However, if you really, really want to eat a lot of food, you got to mix that up. You can't always be eating donuts and pizza because your body's going to fight back. If you, if like with us, we'll make like a five course meal of delicious fucking food. You'll have meat, veggies, sweets, fruit, all of the stuff. I mean, if you've seen Sam's videos where he does like, like these dinners, like it's all, it's about variety. What is it? Variety is the spice of life. It's also the spice of fucking gainerism. <laughs> I got to tell you, I feel like I hop in this point so much. Like so many gainers I know who are like, how do you boil an egg? And that's not even the sarcasm girl. It's people who are straight up like, I don't know. And I'm, and it, it distresses me. It distresses me because first of all, I don't want to come around your house because I don't know what you cook and, but I don't fucking want it. Second of all, again, back on that notion of dating, like I understand like from a sexism perspective, like it's okay to expect that like a certain type of person should be providing and doing the food all the time. But just in general, everybody should know how to cook. Like, if I'm on a date with you and you say, oh, come round, I'm a cook. You say, baby, I'm already like, shit, you just, <laughs> you just jump the charts, you know, Disney fast pass. You just jump to the front of the queue, baby. Like, cause you, you actually know how to make something happen. Like there's something really intimate and romantic as well. When you cook and prepare a meal for someone, you know, and maybe you collaborate and you know, they're, they're, they're like your sous chef and maybe you, you know, it's a feast you made together, whatever. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. But speaking from experience, there is a genuinely beautiful moment when you like craft a meal specifically for someone and you get to watch them eat it. And it's that moment of bliss on their face where you're like, ah, oh, fuck yeah. Like there is nothing quite like that sense of satisfaction. And again, there is a real intimacy and romance that can come with that. So it oh, behooves yeah. you to learn how to make some shit. Just saying. There's a Julia Child quote, I think, where it's, she said, and I can't, I'm not going to quote it correctly, but it's basically like to keep, how to keep like your husband happy or something. And it's like, feed him, flatter him, fuck him. Not necessarily in those or that order, but like, you're exactly right. So I like to tell people like after they cook, not just like, oh, this is good food or like, oh, wow, this is yummy. But like, you did a good job. And like, I get pretty goony. So with Sam, it's like, like, you did a good job. Like, I'm proud of you. And like rubs his belly, you know. <laughs> That's really adorable. That's fabulous. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a man do that for me. <laughs> I mean, anyone listening who wants to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we talked about it in the intro or in our, when we were meeting each other. We're not too far away from each other, big boy. <laughs> that's true well, well there you go there you go um i wanted to ask a question about you know how expectations differ you know from the lived experience but as you've been expressing like you know there is far more reality to your relationship than what people might expect so i want to pivot then and ask maybe what has been the most unexpected aspect of your relationship thus far oh man that's a tough one. Um, I, I think of two. So number one, ever, I mean, not that Sam isn't sloppy when he wants to be, but like when Sam moved into my house, he was like, hey, can you, do you have any soap? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. 
not that I'm like, you know, really, I am pretty stinky. I'll be honest. I'm that's like, I, I haven't worn deodorant since I was in high school. I haven't used, I, I did end up getting like some of the dove sensitive skin soap once Sam moved around and now we keep that in there. But I'll be honest, this man kind of has to barter with me to get in the shower sometimes. <laughs> So that was one misconception was that people were like, Sam's going to be like the fat, gross, dirty, smelly, stinky one. Um, but that's definitely a me thing. Uh, luckily, yeah, say, though, that's really, that's really fucking hot. Though. I love a man that doesn't <laughs> wear deodorant. I love the natural smell of men. I don't know why deodorant is it. Th I mean, I get it. Like socially, people don't want to have to like smell that in public, but. <clears throat> no, you know there is something right like not not to deviate slightly from the conversation here but like years ago people started to find out that like actually we should not be showering every single day in fact it's probably closer to like if you want to be the most like clean it should be once in every three or four because part of what keeps your skin because it's an organ it's a flesh thing like in order to keep your skin organ happy it needs to secrete the oils that are naturally on your skin and the scent to protect it against things. It's part of the healthy ecosystem. And when you're constantly washing and scrubbing that away, it makes sense why now as a society, we have to introduce creams and serums and fucking, fucking beaches cum loads to rub back into your face to <laughs> rehydrate and rejuvenate because or what about like if we're still talking about deodorant what about that like all natural deodorant movement that happened it's like oh yeah people discovered that all the crap that they were putting in it was actually cancerous yeah like so now they have to switch to like coconut oil and patchouli and it's like how did y'all not figure this out sooner once again indigenous and first nations peoples just rolling their eyes at white bitches being like you know we were doing just fine rubbing flower petals and doing all sorts and y'all were out here making things way too complicated so no yeah that was uh i think i just like probably like maybe 2021 uh i was kind of like i don't know what i'm i'm not doing anything but it's working so i'm just gonna keep on keep on doing it but um so yeah i think that that's definitely one of the the i don't know if you, not misconceptions you were saying something about like um maybe surprises so that was one uh the other big one is that like i mean no shit people are fat phobic especially like in the united states we're taught to be that way from like you know when we were born and um like even like our moms they need to or whoever births us they need to get back in shape as soon as they fucking can um and so it was just my friends super surprised me um now that we're thinking about it or that i'm thinking about it like none of my friends have ever treated sam differently because he's you know 350 pounds and you know they're not and none of my friends have been weird or rude um i mean it helps that he's fucking nice and super chill um but yeah that was probably the other big thing was just like i don't know it it also like helped me like i i have been challenged in my fat phobias you know um from dating sam and he's helped me be just a nicer person well you know again that was another question we wanted to ask is like how has this relationship helped or hindered you know we might say your gaming journey but i mean for anyone like your journey with fatness in general and you know how you perceive your own body how you see yourself in the world because oftentimes you know we mention this in a lot of our dating episodes when it comes to someone who isn't doing the growing there is a sense of privilege that people will still hold being in the world because you're not doing the growing you're straight sized you get to kind of go out and be perceived as whoever whatever that's fabulous but it also means that people don't then get challenged on those notions of fat phobia that maybe they haven't thought to think about before so it's really good to know once again that there's this dynamic in your relationship where those things are really coming to the fore and it's really allowing you a safe space to maybe work through trauma where that's appropriate or even just work through bias if that's all that there is lurking down there but that's wonderful i mean Tim, in your experience, how was that conversation with Matt over time? Do you feel like there's been struggles there or do you feel like he's been quite good and quite malleable when it comes to unpicking and unpacking certain things? About being a gainer, you mean? 
or gaining, but also fatness in general, because <clears throat> he's not, I, I would argue that, because because Matt's a little chunky, but yeah. I would still argue he would occupy what is thought of as being straight. Average. You know, like, he, in I don't perceive there to be a scenario or environment where someone would really look at him and go, oh, fat. Yeah, no, he's he's got some, you know, meat on him because he's a rugby player, um, you know, and he he's always going to have some fat around his midsection you know that's just the way it's always going to be um but yeah he's much more straight size now he's also a chaos goblin mm. so he has a very snarky sense of humor and you know like if he makes fat jokes like yeah they're they're fat jokes but they are funny because they're cunty you know <laughs> and he uh when I told him initially that like, Hey, by the way, I'm a gainer. I intend to get bigger. Are you okay with that? He was like, well, I don't really like skinny guys anyway. Like he doesn't usually go after skinny men. Um, the only stipulation he put on it was that he's, he said he's not into super chubs. And I'm like, well, I don't really plan to become a super chub anyway. Like I think 300 is probably going to be my end goal, you know? So, and then just over time, like he'll make little jokes at my expense about being a gainer. He'll be like, to like pull food away from me and be like you're on a diet you know like teasing me and uh, <laughs> stuff like that um he said something the other day i can't remember it was funny but it was something about me putting on weight and um so he'll he'll just just do little jabs like that but i know it's all you know and he doesn't mean any of it mm. i mean look teasing and humiliation those are very much common gainer kings that many of us appreciate you know and there's also oh, yeah. banter that many of us who actively gain will have with one another sam so i this is like a part of our daily dialogue <laughs> um like i definitely call him like my fat boy or my tubbo and things like that but i always when it feels like there needs to be a check-in there's always like regular check-ins be like like do you still like that? And you're like, oh, fuck yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, and, uh, I would love that too. Like, I that that's one thing he doesn't really do, but I would love that. Um, and it's like I'm not into the humiliation side of things, but I do like light teasing, like a little reading, gentle ribbing. I can handle pet that. Names. Pet names. Yeah. I don't really care for piggy. I've never really liked that one. <laughs> but um, you know, like it just it, I, I like the affectionate way that that. You know, it, it just, to me, that's like saying, I love you, you know? Mm. And it's helped our, like, I was mentioning my friends being more comfy. Like, if we're all out doing something and I pat his belly, I'm like, how are you doing, big boy? It, like, you know, that's just how I check in. And then, like, it, I have watched it, like, change the way, like, my friends, you know, straight, cis, whatever, um, queer, it's changed the way that they also interact with Sam. Like it's fat is not a bad thing. It's not a bad word. It's not something to be scared of. So like now one of my friends absolutely loves Sam's hugs. Cause I mean, he's giant and he can bench like 350 fucking pounds. So it's like, uh, when he squeezes you, like <laughs> you better be careful. Yeah. And he'll actually be like, Oh yeah, big boy hug. And he gets like excited and, it's always in such it's always in such good fun it's not negative mm. i was having this conversation with a friend um we caught up for lunch recently and we were having this conversation you know sometimes it is the public declaration and ownership of fat that allows everyone else around you to feel more comfortable which you know when we talk about reclaiming space and educating other people there is an aspect to which it's not our job we don't have to do that making other people feel comfortable is not a requirement however in the grand scheme of things when we have an opportunity to live in our authentic self live our authentic lives and it can and does actively have positive effects on people you know when you choose to not say monitor your language but be more selective about the phrasing that you use when it comes to like what are you attracted to oh i like curvy i like you know thick I like big, just say fat, mm -hmm. just say fat, just say it. Like the only offense that fat has is what we give to it. You know, it is ultimately a descriptor. And when we dance around that notion, we create the same kind of weird hangups that people end up having about all sorts of other things. Like when you were a kid, genuine question here, what did your parents tell you a penis and a vagina were called? Because I guarantee you, they didn't call it a fucking penis and vagina. 
Yeah, mine did not. My mom called my mom called the vagina a yin yang. A yin yang. Yeah. And what what you call a penis? I'm trying to think. Oh, just like pee pee. A little pee pee. Yeah, pee pee. Tim, <laughs> what about for you? Uh, <clears throat> Believe it or not, for as Catholic as my mother is, she did use the correct terms when she oh, wow. gave me the sex talk. And I guess she made that a point to like, you know, she didn't because she probably didn't want me running around like as a, you know, minor saying the word dick or cock or being you know, a puss or, you know, something like that. She probably didn't want me picking up words like that and saying them in the house. So she if I was going to say it, she'd rather I at least use the correct word. Listen, Ronnie, if you're out there listening. Excellent job, babe applause for you on that one good job my my mom called it a willy and a mickey <laughs> a willy oh, and wow yeah 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 there you go that's why that's why i grew up listeners what did your parents teach you a penis and a vagina were called write into us at the thick radio <laughs> at gmail.com and let us know we're waiting for your court now our call, our, what, what is it people say on those things like our 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 our, our callers are on step on stand oh, our our uh, our or something is on standby. Yeah, like when they used to do telethons. I don't remember exactly. what our listeners are standing by or something like that. Our team is on standby. They're standing by waiting for your call about penises and vagina. Exactly. You know what I'm talking the, about. The, the fat the fatties with their notebooks are waiting to to scribble it down, you know. Scribble it down. Yeah. Yeah. Just just picture Delta work with with like a, a an ink pen quill just sort of scribbling something on some light parchment. I think that's the vibe. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, like, that's the whole thing. Like, when we use flowery language or different language to describe fat, we just create this same weird hang up where people don't feel comfortable talking about penis and vagina. And it creates this totally unnecessary thing because we don't want to, like, deal with our own shame around it. So, yeah. You know, this makes me think of Nicole Byer because I saw her on one of the late night talk shows and they were the host. I can't remember who it was, was mentioning like her Instagram page and how she was. I think she had just bought a house somewhere and she had a pool and she was throwing pool parties and she was wearing these really cute bikinis and two pieces and, and everything. And I think that the host must have intimated something about, Oh, are you sure you want to show off that much of your body? And she just goes, people can see that I'm fat. It's, it's no secret. Everyone can see that I'm fat. So why not look good? Like why not wear something cute? Because it's not going to like, just because I cover myself up doesn't mean that the fat disappears. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. There is, and I know that we've made this point on the podcast a number of times before. There is an element to which, no, you don't have to come out of the pantry about being a gainer or loving gaining if you don't want to. You don't have to go to your nearest skyscraper rooftop and shout it to the heavens. But there is something to be said about occupying space that when people make snippy little comments or when people try to push for something, we hold our ground and we let people know, like, we're not going to be affected by that. Like, I'm fine with this. So, again, food, ironically, for thought, for listeners, not just in our own lives, but when it comes to being with gainers and when it comes to being in relationship with gainers. There is an element of occupying space that I think shows a much deeper sign of respect for your partner than if you were to say nothing at all. There was something, are we, are we still kind of in like how it's affected, like my perspective on fat, like with being with Sam? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking around all of it, baby. So whatever okay. you want to say, jump in. Cause, okay. So Back in 2016, I had heart surgery. I had I had been born with a heart condition and knew it was going to come at some point, but it was supposed to be like later 30s. And then here I am at 20, early 26, and I have to have this heart surgery. And I remember it happened in an emergency situation, and I lost. I went from 225 pounds down to 145 pounds in probably about four months, um, which that's almost 100 pounds. Um and my dad had just passed away. So a lot of people just thought I was sad. And I remember at his funeral, um, I remember people came up and were like, wow, Casey, like, you look really good. Like, I know you're sad, but like, you look so good. And this and that come, come to find out I'm fucking dying, you know, and they're only telling me okay. that because I look really thin. Um, and then uh, the week before I went to the hospital, I went to a restaurant with my mom. And afterwards, she's like, like, what's wrong? I was like, I felt like like, can you be honest with me? She said, yeah, I was like, we're, it felt like people were staring at me 
because I was so pale and so thin. And at that time I had really long, like I had a set of nails on and she's like, people were looking at you. And I was like, fuck. And, you know, then a couple months later, it was just this reality check that I look at pictures now from back then where I weighed 60 pounds less than I do um, right now. And I remember feeling fat. And because of feeling fat, I felt ugly. Um, and now, like after all these years and heart surgery, obviously it's a big thing. Anything like that is going to be really cathartic and help you reflect on your life. But one of the biggest things that it changed for me was like the way that I feel about the way I look is all in my head. And it doesn't have to do so much with my size. It has more to do with my health. And so like dating Sam and being with someone who is bigger and like, since I've been with Sam, I've gone from 214 pounds to 250 pounds. Granted, most of it is muscle. Um, but like, I do have a bigger belly and things like that. And it's challenged me in like the way that I feel. And we've had, we've actually had to check in, you know, be like, I don't feel attractive and I'm trying to figure out like, is it because I have a bigger stomach? Like, is that what's going on? Do I feel good? Like, do I feel healthy having the extra weight to carry around? And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, it was just kind of making me think about that. Like it's all, it's all in my head, you know, and fat does not equal attractiveness and vice versa. You know? This is, I, and I, and I just want to say thank you so much for sharing that experience because I know I know that we shared this on the podcast before that this is unfortunately such a common trope of people who've lost weight for many different reasons, many different reasons. And the response from people around them is to go, you look great. Like the typical story is the woman who's got cancer. She's, she's going to chemotherapy. She's, you know, struggling to remain alive. And people are like, you look better now. Like, how offensive to be like you you look better half dead than just alive and happy like at the core of so much fat phobia is truly this statement of i would rather you off this i would rather you gone than like fat and happy like that is how much fat phobia is rooted in the just d d detesting of fat people and that story that it, it's so powerful and it's so important because we need to remember that there is more to the conversation than just what I like or what makes me horny. There is actually so much experience to be discussed. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, <clears throat> talking a little bit about, as you say, you've grown a bit and it's that question of like, are you comfortable in your body, in your relationship with Sam? I mean, how does your relationship stack up to the projected fantasies that, you know, when you did your research, you, you learned a bit about gaining and maybe got a bit of an idea of these are some of the things that might come down the pipe at some stage, how much of that has manifested and how much of that is just malarkey? I think we have, uh, that's a good question. So I've met a lot of people I've gone to like, I've gone to one kind of grammar off kind of event. And then obviously I've been with some super chubs and some um, Sam uh, people, Sam size. Um, and so I've had a good smattering of the activities, like all sorts of things. We talked about force feeding. I mean, we've done that. We've done, you know, the VOR, the, the MPREG, the, you know, what is it called? A fucking funnel. Like, <laughs> um, so there's definitely things that, um being so open with sam means that we can approach every sexual experience as like a playground pretty much so like what do you do on a playground when you're a kid if there's a bunch of toys out there if you're playing with something you, like you want to play with it you pick it up if you don't like it you put it down it's not like you pick something up play with it you don't like it and it becomes a life crisis so one thing and again I, i've said this a couple times here i did okay like I did want to make sure I was protecting Sam's privacy too, because we're talking about a relationship and he okayed me to talk about it. But there has been, <clears throat> there was 
we have had conversations uh, about like my sexuality um, because I love worshiping him, right? He's a fat boy. I love it. I want to make him feel beautiful. I am, but do consider myself an encourager now. Um, however, my entire sexuality is not wrapped up in worshiping someone else. I want to feel desired. I want to feel sexy. I want to feel worshipped. Sometimes I want to get slammed up against a fucking wall and have my throat fucking brutalized. That's not going to happen when you got a three inch cock, you know, that's surrounded in fat. And so <laughs> we, you know, we have to have these conversations in order to increase the longevity and like health of our, it's not just longevity, but increase the health of our relationship. And mm -hmm. Sam, Sam has been able to um, have those conversations with me. I've had conversations with Sam that I've never had with anybody else because I was worried it was going to be a big, huge mess, you know? And with Sam, it's like, Hey, can we talk about this? And then we have those conversations. And so that's where we, you know, we do have, we have uh, <laughs> a, a, anything except anal day is what we call it. So like every like three or four months, I basically am allowed to just go find someone whose dick pokes out of their body a little more and they can like, you know, brutalize my mouth and I can, you know, I don't know, get pissed on in the woods. I don't know. Basically anything that like we maybe can't do, um, because of Sam's size or because it's just not something that we're into. Like we've had really frank conversations, like, you know, being when I, when we decided to date each other, that was not me deciding that I was never going to have anal sex again. Mm. And like being super real about it with each other. Um, I'm, I'm curious and I should, probably shouldn't assume that, that he would want something like this, but like, say if, you know, someone really wanted to like worship his body, worship his belly, like, you know, have a, an intimate, you know, body worship and gain or play session with him. Are you, are you cool with that if he wants to do it or. Oh yeah. Yeah. Our rules. So the, ba the most basic way to describe our rules is we're open for business. So but we've started to open that up. So basically the re the reason why I've had more freedom in that way sexually is not because I wouldn't give the freedom to him. It's because there's some things that he doesn't want to do that I told him at the beginning of our relationship that I would really, that I don't want to just stop doing because he doesn't want to do them. Gotcha. Um, so like um, I would be fine with him going and getting worshiped by someone, but I don't know if he would do it unless it was for film or for pay because he can get that at home, you know, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll worship him all the time. It's just, I don't want to worship him. I would, I'm trying to think how to word this. I don't want to worship him seven days a week if I never, ever get worshiped. Yeah. So yeah. like, yeah. This is something that, and I don't know how many gainers talk about this, um, but I know we've referenced this in relation to, you know, when we've done episodes centering on encouragers, on admirers, on non-gainers, and how sometimes I think we do forget, as gainers in this community, that it's not all about us, actually. Like, yes, it's lovely that there is a contingency of wonderful human beings who want to worship and play with us and have a wonderful time because they're sexually interested in fat. We're interested in being appreciated. It's, it's a win-win, right? Except sometimes the non-fat person wants to be the center of attention. And sometimes I wonder how much gainers really consider the gaining narrative where they themselves are not in the middle of it. Like, what does your gaining experience look like when you're not in the middle of it? What about when someone else wants to be the eater? I mean, for goodness sake, gainers have to consider that when they're playing with another gainer as it is. So what about when it's someone else? What about when it's not necessarily just fat? So I think that's such a crucial point, again, to reference, especially, again, when we talk about sustained relationships, a gainer and an encourager, it cannot always be one person serving another there has to be some kind of reciprocity there has to be some kind of cyclical nature that allows that transference of intimacy to run its course through the relationship otherwise mm -hmm. there is a permanent imbalance that doesn't get addressed and then people are no doubt going to feel like shit, and then things aren't going to end up in a good place i mean for you was that <sighs> 
because I know you've been expressing, like, having had that conversation with Sam, but if I can probe you, was that an easy conversation to have? Did you find Sam receptive to that conversation? What was that like? <clears throat> oh, I, sorry. I don't cry very often, oh. so we're good. I just, like, <laughs> I was like, shit, am I going to cry? Uh, Sam really fucking loves me, so, like, he will have conversations with me. He's always receptive, always, 1,000% of the time. Um, even when, like, I mean, we both fuck up. So, like, even when there's a Sam fuck up moment, he's still receptive to talking about it. Um, I'm probably making everyone get a crush on my boyfriend right now, but that's fucking awesome. <laughs> um, but, yes, it's uncomfortable. And when you were saying uh, what you said a moment ago, like, you're really touching on it. And I think like one of the biggest things, if I like, if I were to say like, what I want people to know about our relationship is just like the importance of being real. Uh, obviously like there are people out there, like people can't handle that I'm real and they get all sassy about it because people just think they're rude. I'm not talking about being rude or disrespectful. I'm talking about checking in with yourself and making sure you approach your partner, how you'd want to be approached by a friend, like treat your partner like a fucking friend and be like, Hey, don't criticize you know, don't do that. But like, just be real. Like when we're talking about me wanting to get a dick, a dick shoved down my throat, it's not that Sam can't do it. It's just that like, you know, if Sam's in a particular, if Sam's, you know, really big, he might not be able to be on his knees for very long or like he might not be able to, you know, pull the fat back all the way um and it, that goes for me too like i love being dirty and i love when my partners are dirty sam has a lot more fat and a lot more things can get hidden sam can't get super fucking dirty because all the time because you know fucking yeast infections you know there's there's actual this is a very physical kink it's the mm. physicality of it it i mean it's not it is kind of a sport it's like you have to be in shape <laughs> in a, you have to be a shape you know um in order to kind of make it work so yeah sam's always super receptive and i have to check in with myself you know how am i being receptive um like i have to make sure i'm fed sam has permission 100 percent of the time to be like hey i love you do you need to eat because <laughs> like if i'm not fed and watered i get, can get pretty grumpy mm. very much <laughs> the same. and you know if i can say this here not to not to be this type of person here, but obviously your partner is someone very well known and very well received in the community. And this is, this is interesting because this season we've, we've got the blessing of a number of more, uh, I don't want to use a certain term, so I'm just going to say more high profile members of the community who are looking to have conversations with us, which is wonderful. And what's incredible is just how many instances we come across where People who, because of the fact that they are so high profile, people develop an expectation or an idea in their head that says, oh, this is what you're going to be like. And oftentimes that idea is not a positive one, which I think just comes from our own internalized ideas of rejection regarding uh, that kind of being high profile. But what's wonderful is learning these aspects about someone where it's reflective of who they really are and who they really are is just fucking lovely. They also happen to be hot, fabulous, but also lovely. We need more lovely people. It's lovely to hear about lovely people and it's lovely to hear about lovely people in lovely relationships, having lovely things happen because loveliness <laughs> is lovely. And I love saying lovely. It's lovely. That's all real though. Very that. I mean, is there an aspect, can I ask you just as we begin to come to the end, is there an aspect of your relationship that we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to talk about? There is, you were talking about like, have I been more sought after now that people know I'm into it? Um, yes and no. So <laughs> you were talking about like how people are in, in reality versus how they portray it online and like, I don't know. I think some people think I'm going to come on here and be like, whoa, bro, what's up? You know, and just be that way the whole fucking time. And so I, I have gotten hit up by a lot of, a lot of chunky guys, um, you know, just in general, but um, also my, my porn tends to be pretty divisive, I guess, just like gainerism is like, not everybody wants to, you know, be all up in the stink all the time. 
um, which they, they wouldn't be, but because that's how it's portrayed online, you know, a lot of people do keep their arms distance, you know, but yeah, that's one thing I guess we hadn't really talked about is like how people have treated me or how people have treated Sam, like since we've been mm. together. I mean, do you feel at least that the reception is positive or, I mean, again, I touched on this a little bit before being a high profile person, sometimes people have a negative projection without impetus, I imagine towards them. Do you feel like any of that negativity has increased because of that relationship or been ported over to you in any regard or have people, fingers crossed, been more respectful and not dicks? People have been fairly respectful. Um, I've you have the outliers. I mean, it's Twitter, so you're gonna get the trolls, for sure. Um, and as we we actually were just talking about this, as we're like getting you know approaching the 50k mark or crossing it, like with Sam, like there's obviously gonna be a few more trolls that pop on there. Like people will, you know, be like, call me absolutely disgusting for you know, talking like, hey, I haven't showered in six days, you know, and then people get on there to write a paragraph you know um and at the same time i'll have people reach out to me sometimes and say discouraging things about i'd love to hang out with you but not your partner um which to me makes someone automatically like not unattractive but like the way that you just said it is unattractive uh um but mostly people have been super super cool um and just throwing it out there i am super down to feed and encourage um folks open for business yeah yo tim uh <laughs> where do you open, live again uh we're in michigan west michigan, michigan. Oh, so i think i looked uh, it up like five hours from you i think okay yeah so you're because i have a friend that lives in detroit so you're probably what another two hours from detroit yep, exactly yeah. two hours and 20 or two hours and 13 minutes i go there next week so um yeah but we're super down open for business is real so like we like to have conversations with folks. We always try to keep it respectful. We have not a book of rules, but we have rules on how we approach um, collabing and communicating with people just so it's transparent with our relationship because that's an automatic no too. If, you're, if your partner is, if it's not all above board, we don't want to be involved. Yeah. And that's real. Like, <laughs> again, today talking about relationships, consent, communication, Disclosure is a part of communication, but I almost feel like it needs to be considered its own topic within communication because everyone's got a different idea on like, how, what do I say? How much do I say? Who needs to know what? But I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. Like, if you're not saying something because it's a non-issue and it's not a problem, then fine. But if you're not saying something because you know that saying something would mean that things are going to have to happen differently, that should be an indicator of something that you need to suss out um, and figure it out quick because um, I can't imagine that many people are going to want to have to reflect on a backlog history of instances if that ends up being the case, but that's its own conversation, I think. <laughs> um, but I suppose just to wrap things up here at the end, is there any advice you would give, like as someone who, as you say, 2022, you're still maybe a little new to this, you're finding your way, you're in a relationship, you're doing what you do. For anyone listening who might look to connect with someone in a typical gainer encourager way, because that's what we're all purporting that we're looking for, right? What advice would you give to make sure that that connection is going to get off to a strong start? Uh, I mentioned the playground analogy that was given to me from a therapist a few years back. Um, she was a sex therapist. Seriously, if you want to play with a toy, I mean, pick it up. And if you enjoy it, that's great. And I don't mean like non-consensual. I mean, like, if you're interested in gainerism or in, in either aspect of it, like, or whatever role, you know, encourager, feeder, the person who's getting fed and getting fat, like, I would just say, don't be a dick. Figure out a respectful way to approach that person. Try it. And if you don't like it, figure out a respectful way to bow out. There's absolutely nothing wrong with um, with trying new things. That's life is very short and also very long. Do it, do it. That's wonderful. But listen, Bate, we are so appreciative of the time you've given to us today, your vulnerability, your willingness to share some of your experiences, 
it's been a pleasure. Just thank you so, so much. Now, where can our listeners find you online? I am on, uh, first of all, yeah, you're welcome. And thanks for having me. I'm very, very happy we got connected. Uh, I am on Twitter at, uh, at B, the number eight inside me, B8 inside me. I'm also on Instagram under the same at B8 inside me. I'm also on Instagram, just more of my personal stuff at uh, one Vembo's journey, uh, just like it sounds. O N E Vembo's journey. Um, you can find my other more, uh, I guess, more taboo profiles off of my link tree on my Twitter. And um, yeah, you all know my partner, but at the underscore roaming hog. Fantastic. Well, that's it for another week here on Thick Radio. Please remember to like and subscribe, rate us five stars, and leave us a good review. Now, if you liked this episode, the podcast, or just us in general, please share it with your friends and encourage them to tune in. You can find me on Instagram and Blue Sky at Stanham. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok at Thicky Mouse. You can also look us up on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Thick Radio, or at our website at podpage.com forward slash Thick Radio. If you want to submit a voice note or become a financial supporter of the show, you can find the links in the show notes. And you can always write to us at thethickradio at gmail.com. So until next time, bye fats. Bye fats. Bye fats. Let's talk about it. Thick Radio is a Patreon and Enter app podcast produced by Stan and Thicky Mouse. Next and Master by Stan. Our artwork is provided by Lucky 2. Our theme song is provided by Spotify Training.